The fourth episode of Walking with Beasts, Next of Kin, is set during the Neogene period, in the late Pliocene epoch, 3.2 million years ago, and is both set and filmed in Ethiopia. I believe that this episode is the only episode to be filmed and set in the same location, which is a cool fact. The very first shot of this episode is... Ah! Uncanny Valley! Uncanny Valley! Yeah, that's an actor in makeup and prosthetics to be made to look like an ape man. Looks okay in extreme close-ups, but thankfully we cut away to a wider shot to show the full face, which is CGI. These primates are all sat quiet and contemplative by a peaceful stream as the narration explains that... Some animals can show emotion. Which of course links them towards humans as the music plays with a sorrowful flute. The camera pans across the group to reveal the eldest female having succumbed to malaria, who lies dead beside her son. Narration states that life is going to be very difficult for this youngster, and the group hierarchy as a whole as the titles appear. Perfect and sad opening for the episode. I'm not sure why this is the case, but the CGI in this episode in particular hasn't aged as well. Everything with the exception of the Dinophilus doesn't look quite right, they're all a bit flat. I particularly love the ambience of the birds and crickets in this episode, however. This is helped a lot by the Montezuma or Pendula calls, which add a sense of exotic atmosphere. Time now for the establishing shots of the Great Rift Valley. Such a beautiful location, and somewhere that hasn't really changed since this episode was set. It's just as stunning and dramatic, and helped in no small way by quite possibly the best unreleased piece of music from the series. It's simply breathtaking, and I could listen to it all day. This is the cradle of evolution for mankind. Oh, so this is where it all went wrong. Maybe Helen Carter had the right idea after all by trying to wipe out humanity. This staggering landscape has such a prehistoric look to it with all the rocky outcroppings, scrubland, and the expanse of grass which has created vast plains of savanna. This shot really helps sell this as it transitions from forest to a grassland. Grass! <laughs> New species have evolved to take up the role of grazers in this environment, and this is also the first episode in the show to prominently feature recognisably extant modern animals in the form of a warthog and a white rhinoceros in this scene, and more later on. The narration also mentions this, and says that this world could be mistaken for the modern day, until you look closer and see the other animals, such as the Dinophilus, which waltzes by. That shot of it is so gorgeous with the way its fur reacts to the light, and the textures look amazing. Looks perfect, honestly. Shame the other CGI creatures in this episode don't hold up as well. We then see said other CGI creatures in the form of the Ancylotherium and Dinotherium, peacefully standing in the grass against the evening light, but still looking out of place. Only the Dinotherium is named here, and it still looks very good for something that came out in 2001, but not on par with its contemporaries. All of these shots suggest that it's now night, but then we cut to day again, as we're properly introduced to the star species of the episode, the Australopithecus. Where do I begin? Australopithecus lived in the Pliocene and early Pleistocene, from about 3.4 to 2.4 million years ago, roughly. These guys don't look terrible at all, considering the constraints of the budget and age of the show, but even so, they are ever so slightly off somehow. The CGI doesn't quite hold up as well for some reason. Despite this, they still fit within the story of the episode and fulfil the needs of it, and thank Darwin they got the animation right, after seeing what other movements they were testing. Even if they don't quite fit in well with the backgrounds, they are very accurate at least. Unsurprisingly, since these animals are essentially upright chimps, they use chimpanzee sounds and calls, which work perfectly, and beats humans trying to emulate their sounds. <laughs> A cool thing about this species within the show is that there's individual variation and sexual dimorphism. The show couldn't really get away with not having at least a male and female model for them, and it's great that there's a juvenile version as well, so not just shrunken versions of the adults. The variation comes in the form of one individual in particular, Grey, who has silvery hairs and one grey eye, both giving him his name and suggesting that he's an older member of the group. The other named individuals are Hercules, a bold and eager male, Black Eye, the Dinophilus dinner, and who also does have a unique texture around her eye which gives her her name, Babel, the newest female, and Blue, the young male who is on the verge of being an outcast. Why so blue? Throughout this episode, the Australopithecus are commended via the narration as being distinct and on an evolutionary journey where they stand out from the rest of the world's animals, mainly for being able to walk upright. So I find it odd that they are praised for being different in this show compared to what is said about them in Walking with Cavemen. Aside from walking upright, there's really nothing very remarkable about these creatures at all. Oh yeah, Walking with Cavemen exists. What happened there? Maybe I should save my thoughts about that for another review series. 
But whilst we're on the subject of that, it's quite interesting to compare the two Australopithecus designs. I'm not too sure which is better really, it's only a matter of my opinion at the end of the day, but the actors in the costumes are a bit restricted with their movements, and their faces are unable to convincingly form complex emotions. The CGI can do this more easily, as it has no restrictions in how it can move. The close-ups of the animatronics do help with fleshing out these, but again, they're fixed expressions that can only be used in short shots. They are shown to use tools, which links them towards their journey of becoming more human and mastering the environment around them. Being upright walking has also freed their hands up to become more dexterous and better adapted to grasp things. They can also learn from watching each other to gain new skills, all qualities of modern day apes. And of course, the best use of this model is not even in this episode, but at the end credits of The Beasts Within. You couldn't make this stuff up. Always look on the light side of life. The Australopithecus's most distinguishing feature, the ability to walk bipedally, is introduced very nicely with one jumping out of the tree and slowly rising to an upright stance. This works brilliantly, if it weren't for the fact that the intro in New Dawn already showed this already. Oh well. The choir is brought in to further link these apes to humans, and one of only two episodes where a choir is used apart from the chanting of the titles, the other being Mammoth Journey. This is also the first episode of the show to have named individuals, the next also having the Smilodon Half-Tooth. This upright walking is correctly stated as a missing link, which is what this species was described as when it was first discovered. These apes walk upright. Nice one. Despite the CGI looking a bit off here, the shadows from the trees casting on the model are done perfectly, as this individual rises to show off his bipedal stance, only to walk a few feet to then sit down again with the others? Alright. They are said and shown to be very social, just like modern chimpanzees, which bicker and quarrel over the social status and positions within the group. Here we see Grey, the eldest of the group and the top male, swaggering along to the others. His status is governed by the female's attitude towards him, however, so he needs their support to remain in charge. What then follows is a short scene of them just screaming at each other. Since the last female died, a new female has come in to replace her, called Babel, who for some reason doesn't like Grey. Practical effects intensify as she communes in Australopithecus to get her important points across, I assume. The sad flute plays again to reveal Blue, the lowest ranking member of the group thanks to now being an orphan. The practical effect on his face is… questionable, yeah it doesn't look great, but at least they made one for him so that the audience connects with him more with this close up. Malaria has had its toll on the group, reducing the count from 12 to 8. Grey's position as top male is further challenged by Hercules, so named because he's strong, I guess? The camera quickly pans to him running towards Grey, holding a tree branch as a weapon. Grey's response is to run in a way which is meant to look intimidating, but comes across as desperate. Their fight is not about violence as such, since they lack any way to properly inflict damage on one another, and so utilise rocks and branches to mount a defensive show instead, as well as some chest beating. It is quite funny to watch though. Grey quickly puts Hercules in his place, however, by demonstrating some gymnastics Kelly Malcolm would be proud of, which is enough to terrify his challenger. That shot with the group surrounded by the boughs of the trees is really nice, as we cut to an overhead view of the forest surrounded by grassland again, with that same beautiful music. The narration explains that a good reason for the origins of humans to be in Africa is that there is a multitude of habitats which all serve the Australopithecus who are comfortable wherever they go. They are good generalists, which helps them survive. We then see a group of Ancylotherium walking by and stopping for a drink. They look pretty good in the wide shot accompanied by the Australopithecus, with a really nice reflection. These guys lived during the late Miocene to early Pleistocene, 11.6 to 1.8 million years ago, and use a recycled Calicothere model but without the knuckle walking animation, instead with flat feet. These were still a type of Calicothere however, so reusing this model makes sense. The colours are really nice, and I think I prefer them over the actual Calicothea design. The striped brown and beige patterning would be beneficial to a herbivorous animal such as this to break up its outline. They appear to be slightly too small if you compare them to the size of the Australopithecus, and should perhaps be a little bigger? I'm not sure. Either way their neck is too short, and their forearms too long, which is a shame as it's a really cool species which suffers from a reused model, but it's not the end of the world. They're mentioned as being harmless neighbours to the Australopithecus, which I guess would be the case. I can't see any conflict arising between them, which would end in violence. Also, the head puppet appears to just be a recoloured version of the Calicothea head, and was likely repurposed after use in Land of Giants, as it appears to have been filmed after. It still looks great when it's used to simulate drinking. 
I have actually seen this puppet in real life, along with quite a few others, at an exhibition for the show at the Horniman Museum in London in 2007. Marching into shot comes a small herd of Dinotherium, even making one Ancylotherium get out of the way as they approach the watering hole. Dinotherium was an extinct genus of elephant-like proboscideans, which coexisted with our ancient relatives up until their recent extinction in the Pleistocene. This is the African species of D. bozassi, which lived from the Middle Pliocene to the Early Pleistocene, around 14 to 1 million years ago. Because they are relatives of elephants, the show uses those animals' sounds for them, which is a fair assumption. Now, I'm a fan of this creature, but sadly the CGI on this thing looks so flat and oddly shiny. The model and colours are really good, but the texturing just doesn't work for some reason. Its trunk also does seem too short, like how would it even be able to drink without sucking water in and spraying it vaguely in the direction of its mouth? If my trunk was that small, I wouldn't draw attention to myself, pal. This is something I've noticed throughout many depictions of this animal, that it's always given a short trunk. The true use of its strange downward curving tusks is still a mystery, but the theory suggested in the show is that they were used for stripping bark off trees, which sounds convincing enough. They were also definitely not as tall as giraffes, despite what Kenneth says, being a more reserved 4 meters tall rather than 4.8 to 5.5 meters like modern giraffes. Unfortunately, there is no baby model for this animal, but then the younger individual only appears very briefly, and so it would make no sense to waste valuable time on creating unique sculpts just for that. These guys bully their way to the watering hole as the Australopithecus retreat into the forest again. We then get a really stunning shot of a waterfall surrounded by thick vegetation. The narration mentions that some weeks have passed which makes a more natural continuation of the quote unquote story, so it isn't all just one thing immediately after another. The males are still squabbling over the position of top male. Blue is still feeling like an outsider and sits alone away from the group. But this is no time for the group to be divided. A cophony of calls with the added detail of sticks being thrown at the group signals the arrival of a rival group which challenges for the territory. This scene is paralleled in the first episode of Walking with Cavemen as well. All of them indulge in some aggressive chest beating to try and see the opponents off. Chimpanzee noises intensify. Gray's group is also small and not strong enough to repel the rivals. There's something about this running animation shot which always makes me laugh. Nice water interaction though. Gray's group retreats into the forest, having been cast out of their territory. Bummer. Out by the shores of a lake, the group stop to drink as the track Great Journeys starts playing, with a solo flute to begin with. Narration also explains that finding a new place to hold a territory won't be easy. What follows are some truly beautiful shots of them walking as the camera pans out to show the Rift Valley. What a beautiful location! The music also swells to be more orchestral, and we hear vocals in the score which help illustrate the concept of humanity slowly taking over the world as the dominant species. Being able to walk upright gives these apes a higher viewpoint of spotting predators. As such, a predator in the form of a reused shot the Dinophilus walks by. It's cool that there are extra layers of grass in front of it though, and it's mirrored. Now that is the absolute money shot of the episode. That sunset with the group silhouetted against it is amazing. Arriving in a northern region, the group wander by, oblivious to the gargantuan elephant behind them. That shot of it actually looks really good. How come it looked worse earlier? The Dinotherium charges at the apes, making one infant fall into the grass in the chaos. This male Dinotherium is in must. Like modern elephants, this makes him very aggressive, and he decides to take it out on the early humans. Who can blame him? The infant is stuck in the grass as the rest of the group hide in the tree. The youngster is Babbles. Of course it is. She attempts a daring rescue, but ends up being chased by the peeved pachyderm. This at least works to distract it. But then the youngster does the worst thing possible. He continues to call out. It's okay, I understand. You're an idiot. Timpanies activate. This is such an awesome slow motion sequence of the Dinotherium stampeding towards the helpless infant. The sounds echo as the camera pans from it to the foot of the giant mammal, which then steps straight onto it. That's it, it's dead. The mournful piano music plays as the Dinotherium walks away, satisfied with its course of action. Wait, what? How? Somehow, the young Australopithecus survived. The group then find what is seemingly a perfect place for them to live. The music here is especially catchy with some cool percussion as the apes settle into their new home around some Ancylotherium. Some close-ups of the Australopithecus puppet eating are a nice touch. And there don't appear to be any other Australopithecus around. Yeah, wonder why. The Ancylotherium then gets scared off by Hercules as they make bizarre honking sounds. 
<laughs> Hercules appears to be the most intelligent member of the group, as he continues to demonstrate useful survival strategies. Meanwhile, Blue is still feeling outcast as other youngsters ignore him while he tries to play with them. Bastards. With the evening approaching, the Australopithecus start to make nests in the trees, much like modern chimpanzees. Narration mentions how all primates used to be nocturnal, like the god Enosha in New Dawn, but have since evolved to be diurnal and have very good colour vision to find food. This takes away their night vision, which carries over to modern apes and humans. At sunset, it's then revealed why there are no other Australopithecus around, thanks to the killer cat, which has one up a tree and watches and waits for its next prey. Ominous, but a great shot. The next day, Black Eye saunters into view, carrying an ostrich. Egg. As she attempts to break into it, a big cat stalks her. Grey then becomes a secondary egg thief as he steals it off her. Now, it's my turn to hold the egg. Distracted by this terrible crime, Black Eye neglects to notice her doom silently creeping up behind her, as the reversed symbols start to play, announcing danger. <coughs> Black Eye becomes cat food. The rest of the group scatter as the predator takes its prize. This is a species of Dinophilus, which lived from the early Pliocene to early Pleistocene, 5 to 1.2 million years ago, and it's easily the standout prehistoric creature of this episode for a number of reasons. Chiefly being it doesn't look terrible, as it blends really well with the real environments, and its design is practically perfect, with the ocelot-like patterning which is so lovely, and would be beneficial to an ambush predator. It displays leopard-like hunting behaviour by lying in wait and pouncing at short distance to then drag its prey up a tree. It's possible that this was how it behaved, but it also could have acted more like a lion by chasing down larger herbivores. It's still a debate. Evidence of predation on early hominids can be attributed to leopards, but not necessarily this animal. Earlier it's mentioned as being a member of the saber-tooth variety, but only having small sabers. This is because Dinophilus is part of a genus of extinct cats called Macarodontinae, which were fairly widespread over most of the worlds during the Miocene to the Pleistocene. Other noteworthy species include Homotherium and of course Smilodon. I haven't got much to say about this thing really, since it doesn't really appear very much, and when it does it behaves so naturally that you could be mistaken for thinking it's a real animal they filmed. The line, our relatives are prey, is really chilling, coupled with the shot of the cat with Black Eye's corpse up a tree. I do like that this is mentioned, as early hominids were by no means at the top of the food chain. That evening the group sit quietly, possibly grieving over Black Eye, like they did with Blue's mother before. This is possibly a day for night shot. Blue finally gets more social interaction by grooming Grey. There's some close-up shots of someone wearing prosthetic hands to do more dexterous interaction on the fur, which is cool. Despite Black Eye's death, a new female has arrived, from somewhere. Female Australopithecus are said to move between groups when they are old enough to mate in order to prevent inbreeding, which is the same as modern chimps, but unlike many species of social mammal where the opposite is true. The other females are not instantly accepting of the newcomer either, however Hercules is quick to take an interest, despite not being the top male as Grey is. Grey is too engrossed in being groomed to realise, as Hercules decides to do the sexy time with the new female. Some very well placed grass hides any intimate details. Try and keep your legs straight. They mate face to face thanks to how their bodies are positioned because of walking upright. Grey interrupts the pair however, and sees Hercules off, as some very odd, almost childlike calls can be heard. Never knew what these were. Blue's one attempt at making friends has been scuppered. All down to that amorous Hercules. The same momentous track from when the Australopithecus are first introduced plays here during the next day to show the tool use and remarkable ingenuity of these apes. As they dig for roots and tubers. Tasty roots. Yummy bulbs. Blue is having to learn fast with the skills he has in order to keep up with the rest of the group, since his mother died. You can also hear a hyena in the background here. A flock of vultures circling overhead can only mean one thing. Meat. We are shown a dead zebra, possibly Chapman's zebra, lying where it presumably died. Why it is untouched and why this black-backed jackal just passes up taking anything from the carcass is unknown. Some vultures soon land and start feeding. Among them are what look to be white back vultures and some lappet-faced vultures. Their feast doesn't last long, however, as Hercules chases them away from the carcass with a stick in hand. I wonder how they got the vultures to fly away like that. Oops, the stick he's holding switches hands between shots. Hercules then proceeds to help himself to the meat, to which Grey takes extreme offence since he's the top male. 
They begin fighting again, this time with three white rhinos watching as well. Were they there earlier? Hercules also utilises his stick as a weapon to really give Grey a good thwacking. The slow motion shots of this really do look uncanny and perhaps remind us viewers of how humans can behave. It's over fairly quickly as Grey makes oddly human gestures like he's saying, enough. Hercules becomes top male, replacing Grey, who looks fittingly peeved. He only had one working eye anyway, and maybe that blinded him to his lack of leadership skills. We get a close-up shot of a human in a costume reaching into the carcass, which blends really well with the other wider shots of the CGI. The vultures, meanwhile, watch longingly from a tree. Narration explains how meat is only a small part of the diet of these apes, but it will become more important for their survival thanks to the colder climates of the Ice Ages, where there is less vegetation to eat. More meat-eating increases brain size, hence why humans develop more intelligence and ultimately conquer the world. Perhaps not for the better. Elsewhere, the group has moved to a rocky outcropping, and it's said that Hercules has already made a difference by becoming top male, making the environment of the group more peaceful. Was Grey really that bad? Despite the positives, these animals are still prey, and... It is only a matter of time before the Dinophilus comes back. That stalking animation is so perfect. Oh, and to really show off just how cool this cat looks, let's go slow motion with it running after the helpless apes. Astounding work, frame store. Lucky all of the Australopithecus reach a tree in time before the Dinophilus gets them. It could just climb up and get them, but eh. Blue, being the inexperienced one, only manages to get to some higher rocks and becomes the target. The rest of the group suddenly descend the safety of the tree to mount an assault on the poor kitty, who is only after one simple meal. They begin throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at it in order to save Blue. A version of Great Journey plays as well to show the combined strength of the group against one solitary predator. Each time the Dinophilus attempts to attack, it gets pushed back. Kind of sad, really. In another example of fourth wall breaking, one of the Australopithecus smashes the camera lens with a rock. The Dinophilus then retreats. I wonder if it found an easier target, like, say... Oi! Blue is lucky that he's at least valued enough to spur this sort of response from the rest of the group. They've done nothing but ignore him this whole time, so it's cool to see this character development. The episode closes on a nice panning shot zooming out of the group with the narration saying how apes still have a long way to go before modern humans evolve. And the really nice little ending line of It will be at least another two million years before any ape has a decent conversation. Some decent conversations. Okay, so it will probably come as no surprise to anyone that this is my least favourite episode of the show. Not only does it lack a lot of prehistoric species, with those that do appear only being fleeting, but also, Aikman are kind of... not my thing. It serves as an important step in evolution and the history of Earth, but even so, I'm not that invested. That being said, there is no bad episode of Walking with Beasts, but if I had to pick one, this would be it. It is cool to see how the modern animal species are integrated and double up as extinct species. I guess since the landscape and fauna hasn't really changed that much, it's fair to use these in this episode, even more so for episode 6, Mammoth Journey. Thank you very much for listening, and look out for my review of episode 5, Sabretooth, soon.